Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Tactical Baby Gear Podcast. Today, we have with me none other than the one and only Tyler Merritt. Tyler is the co-founder and CEO of Nine Line Apparel. And in this episode, we kind of talk about his military career, how Nine Line got started, what the Nine Line Foundation is up to, uh, what it's like for him being a father, and a few other things. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. What's up, Tyler? What's up? How's it going? Good, man. Good. Thanks for coming. I know that things have been crazy for you. You guys uh, are making waves across the news again, this time poking at uh, Starbucks. Yes, this is not Starbucks. This tastes wonderful. That's, that, that's Black right. Rifle. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's great. Um, <laughs> Starbucks tastes like shit and a blind taste test done by me. <laughs> <laughs> and now that it's going to be on the internet. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's obviously right. it's true. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us more about that. So <laughs> Starbucks is, had asked some police officers to leave a store because some customers felt uncomfortable with police officers in there. Yeah, um, usually criminals feel uncomfortable when police are around. <laughs> exactly what I said this morning. <laughs> yep, but uh, the the sad thing is, is the culture, and it's the the way that that Starbucks has presented itself to the world as a extreme leftist hangout spot. You know, there's, there's jokes around the internet about going to the barista in your, your, uh, hipster outfit. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the thing is that the hipsters did not create the barista, right? You know, that the, there's alternatives out there and they're going to realize that they don't own the coffee market. And, you know, we're super pumped to be partnered with black rifle because they, they have a value set that resonates with me and with the group of individuals that I associate myself with. Right. And your business, just yeah. nine line apparel, by the absolutely. way. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that's where you find like-minded organizations, um, yourself included, where I like to partner with individuals that I don't mind being around. Right. Uh, it, it, the money at the end of the day is great, but right. that's like an added bonus to it. it right. It's if like icing on the cake. If you don't like what you're doing, change it. Mm -hmm. I, I love being in the army. I was in since 2002, went to West Point, uh, spent 15 years, years thereafter. I loved every minute of it and I wouldn't change anything for the world. Uh, but if I, if I was unhappy at one point, I would have just ended that career. Right. Uh, it, it ended for me, uh, right. which is nice. Talk about your career in the military. L let's tell them a little bit more about what you did and, um, how that transitioned into nine line. Cause Nine line kind of started on accident. Is yeah. that is it right? Yeah, I think a lot of businesses and, and entrepreneurs they just fall into it, mm -hmm. uh, especially people who have that same spirit of just trying to innovate. Uh, so while I was in active duty, I like to tinker around with things on the internet. And I like to build websites. I like to see how I could uh, make things better. And I had a problem with finding rental properties. I was moving all the time. You know, I joke around, but my uh, nine-year-old has moved six times. Uh, my 17-year-old has moved about 15 times. I've moved 26 times in my life. And so finding a rental property around military bases was important to me. So I created a database and I worked with other people and um, you know, I didn't, that, that business did not end up succeeding. Um, not by lack of effort, but, I, but <laughs> some I'd, things just don't work it didn't out. Work out, and, then and you a, have to be willing to recognize that and just cut your losses and move on. Absolutely, too. and I and I pivoted, but I took a lot of the uh, lessons learned and the technology that I built, uh, and I turned it into Nine Line because there was another problem in my unit at the time, which was morale. Uh, we were deploying more than any special ops unit to date. Uh, and it was like that badge of honor. Oh, I'm never home. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, on average, we busted every single mandate from SOCOM of this is how many days you should have dwell time at home with your family. We've mm -hmm. never had it. You know, the, my kids would see me put on my uniform and they would freak out because they didn't know if I was leaving for a day, a week, a month, month six months. Right. Uh, and so that, that really uh, put a damper on morale. Add to that the carnage of war and people losing their lives and constant chaos. Um, and a lot of unknown from your wife, I'm sure, of like, well, I haven't talked to Tyler in a while and I don't know. Absolutely. And then when she did talk to me, it was like, hey, I know we're in the middle of building this business. Uh, I sold our house while I'm deployed. <laughs> And uh, I need you to move. I know you're pregnant and uh, we've got two kids at home. Um, 
but I, I need you to also run the business and stop going to school because we can't afford that now. So, uh, you know, that's the trials and tribulations of the military spouse. And, right. you know, they are there to support us while we're gone. I definitely couldn't have done her job. Uh, and, and that's that relationship between my wife and my kids, you know, obviously solidified, but it had serious ups and serious downs. Um, and, and again, I wouldn't change anything for the world, but, uh, you know, it's, it gives you time to reflect and see who I am today is because of my past, you know, right. it shaped and defines me good, bad, and different. Uh, I think all of the lessons I learned growing up from, you know, my father and, and growing up in the military and uh, starting. Was and, your, your dad was in the military? No. Oh. No, my dad was as bad as hippie as they come. <laughs> your dad's uh, awesome. I love chill. coming. I love coming to the office <laughs> and seeing your dad. He's like, Mr. Merritt's always around. Like, yeah. And he's working but like his work ethic harder is, than anyone else there. Absolutely. Like the first time I met him was at the old spot that. And he's like pushing a cart of t-shirts from one building to another and like sweating. It's August. And he's like, yep. he's getting it every There's time. One person who could outwork me, it might be my father. And I, and that's something that I, I grew up respecting, you know, Hey, do you want something? Yes. I would love to have a motorcycle. I'm eight years old. Great. Go start mowing lawns. Right. Go start doing chores. And I, you know, became creative. He's like, hey, every stick you pick up, I'll give you a nickel. So I started breaking sticks. <laughs> <laughs> One big stick into Just little scaling it. And you know, now that I have kids, I, I tell my daughter things like that, and she will find that gray area where she's like, good for her. Said. Getting I'm creative. Like, well, I mean, it's you know like, what? yeah. But that's, that's what uh, uh, drives innovation. Do you want something? You know, we're a capitalist society. There's things that we want. I look at your wall of weapons. And I'm like, I want those. Right, right. Uh, but those cost money. And that money has to be earned. And that's the, the work ethic that you try to instill in your kids. And I mm -hmm. think my dad did a pretty good job. Uh, I think I'm, I'm trying to do as good a job with yeah. my children. Uh, but, you know, as we become successful, you know, I, I didn't grow up with all the niceties. Uh, and, and I've been through some crazy stuff. You know, I've been shot at, I've been stabbed. I've been, uh, in hospitals for many periods of times. And I don't want my kids to ever have to go through any of those things. Right. And that's where, you know, you, you try to find the balance between providing them, uh, the niceties of life and letting them go through those same trials and tribulations. For sure. Build some character. Yeah. So you talked about, um, you know, the, the necessity for morale, in the military, um, for I, I want to back up a little bit more. What were you? What was your job in the military? What did? What were you doing for most of your career while being deployed and doing all those things? I was a glorified bus driver. Stop it! Mm -hmm. You're so humble. No. I flew uh, helicopters for uh, special operations primarily um, in the 160th, and before that, I flew Apaches. Uh, so I was a, a death stalker to a night stalker. Uh, Got it. So I, I was just a stalker, I guess. Um, not but a, it, not a bad way to have some fun. No, I, I always had a fascination with flying and aviation. That's all I ever wanted to do. Ask these guys all I talk about every single day. Like my birthday was a week ago. I was like, who got me a helicopter for my birthday? <laughs> like I want a helicopter so bad. I'm working And on that's it. what I'm working for, you know? I think it's the coolest thing. My mom actually got me a helicopter this year, but it's like a little toy helicopter. Yeah. Uh, she's like, well, you've always wanted one. You know, I finally, and I was like, what'd you get? You know, she's like, got you a helicopter. I'm like, yep. ah. Well, there's good advice so out there. If it flies, floats, and other things, you should rent it. <laughs> <laughs> so I should it. return the boat I just bought? Yes. <laughs> Immediately. <laughs> um, cool. So that was your military career, flying helicopters as a stalker of mm -hmm. sorts. Mm -hmm. um, and then that, that necessity for morale and how that turned into Nine Line. Tell us about that. So you have a group of guys, small subset of a small subset that are constantly gone. And so we have these morale shirts to try to boost the morale. So we'll be deployed to different units, organizations. For example, I uh, deployed to it overseas in the Arabian Peninsula with guys from SEAL Team 7, uh, Eddie Gallagher's unit. Uh, and, and we would create these shirts to show esprit de corps, you know, the, the relationship between us and their unit and maybe the mission set we're on or uh, just a, a unit morale just for our unit mm -hmm. um, like we were unit with a certain number to that you know that's right that's something that I can wear now and remember and reflect back <clears throat> um, 
So kind of a time piece. You're just yeah, like, but this was this shirt represents this time, this era, this location, this yep. mission, this whatever. Well, then that becomes classified. You can't put all those things on the same shirt. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, to you, it means those yeah, things. Yeah, and, and for me, coming from flying uh, Apaches, and I was the the you know commander there to uh, the Night Stalkers, you start all over. So go from that to being the guy who cleans out the refrigerator or the guy who makes the T-shirt order. And that's the one that I picked up as an additional duty as a, one of 10 million that we had. Mm -hmm. um, but it was like the grunt work, go sweep the yeah. floors. <clears throat> and it was go, a pain in the butt. Go find us some shirts. Yeah. So yeah. I had to go collect information from individuals, collect funds, then go find someone to print it. Then I got these itchy, nasty, gilded shirts that had one color on it, and they were charging me you know, a ridiculous amount of money. <clears throat> and then I had to deal with the wrong sizes and, you know, back and forth. So I was like, hey, you know what? I like building platforms. So I just built a website and then I made it secure and I passed it out to friends and family and it was much easier to manage. So we started doing that for other units. Uh, and then I didn't like the brands that we were using. You know, Nike, didn't, Nike didn't resonate with me. Um, you know, the Gildan doesn't really have a, a meaning or call it's to action. It's a blank, yeah. It's just a blank shirt. So I, I wanted something that resonated with our community, uh, that meant something. And I think everyone knows what that nine line terminology is in the military. And then it went from seeing that there's a big gap in the, at this time, a civil military divide. And I'm from Greenwich, Connecticut. I think there's three other people in the military from Greenwich, Connecticut. Uh, and you know, I would go there with my friends coming back from deployments and do fundraiser for say we're building at this point building houses for severely wounded veterans some of my friends this individual's name is mark holbert um he's a fifth group guy <clears throat> lost both his legs over in afghanistan great guy uh we're building a house in dc for him so hey you know what let's do a fundraiser in connecticut show up you know guys are coming in with mclarens and ferraris this hundred million dollar estate and i raised more money in a backyard barbecue in Savannah than I did there. You know, it was after all expenses paid, I think we netted like five grand. And it was horrible. What? And yeah, and, and these guys would ask questions like, are we still at war? Like, yes, dude. You're like, we're we doing are, this wrong right now. Yeah, just I'm in the <laughs> middle of my deployment. I'm going back in a couple of weeks. Right. Like, kid, this is serious. This is my friend who just lost his legs trying to build a house for him and his family. Um, and, and that's where this, you know, drive to close that divide to try to bridge the gap between those who served and those who didn't and have a conversation and educate people because you're talking about uh one percent of the population that maybe he has friends and family with maybe that expands out to the direct relationship of say 10 percent of america but there's a big gap in certain areas so rather than be confrontational say oh, i'm a grunt you're nothing because right. you never served i think that's a horrible mentality to right. take it's you know, hey, I'm wearing this shirt because I support, you know, the men in blue, because I support the men in the military, because I believe in USA made manufacturing, because I like having a conversation and being a voice for first responders and, and veterans who oftentimes don't have the money to provide themselves the right counsel to have a voice to defend themselves. Right. And that's those are the things that we care about. Mm -hmm. Cool. So you had mentioned uh, being deployed with Gallagher's unit. Nine lines making a big push, uh, or may, you guys are making a, a lot, stirring the pot, not stirring the pot, but bringing a lot of um, awareness around that situation. Um, you know, you've become an authority on Fox News of like, it's always Tyler Merritt on talking about some recent events, whether that's Gallagher or Nike or Starbucks. What was, uh, and that all kind of just came full circle finally for Gallagher, right? Tell us more about that. Yeah, it was a great 4th of July uh, week for him and Andrea and the rest of the legal team. Uh, it's been a long battle. By the time we learned so about for, this. So for you guys that don't know who Eddie Gallagher is and what the situation is, they were trying to prosecute. He's a father. He's a uh, yeah. soldier, and he was a Navy SEAL for 20 years who uh, had what you would consider a modern-day mutiny, a coup d'etat from his unit, three individuals, three bad actors that do not represent the Navy SEAL credo uh, that decided to uh, get rid of their leader, not through a bullet like they did in Vietnam, fratricide, but by making false accusations. Uh, and eventually one of them came forward and said, you know what, it wasn't Eddie Gallagher that killed this child right that's, that was the narrative that's what the new york times said navy seal kills baby child that's basically what they wrote um and it, they didn't say the story which 
I'll, I'll explain it really quickly. Mm -hmm. It's a, an Apache guy I follow a target that's usually uh, a beacon because dumbasses. I don't know if I could say that they mm -hmm. carry this thing around, which is a beacon, and then we drop bombs on them. So we followed this child, right, a, a 15 year old military age male. That's what we would call him, uh, to a building, and then we blew up the building. And 39 people died. He survived. And the Iraqi general grabbed him, threw him on top of his Humvee, drove him to Eddie and said, keep him alive so I can keep torturing him later. Uh, you know, sodomize him. There, he's going to die, but we're going to get as much information as we can. Right. <clears throat> Common practice. Everyone knows that. You know, and our, our job, just so everyone knows, it's to advise and assist. Whatever they ask us to do, even outside morality of what we would say is that's just wrong. Uh, that's what our job is to do for the end game of keeping Americans safe and free. Absolutely, because <laughs> uh, it, these all... it, it they they will come here and we thwart their efforts. Well, we've seen it happen on a regular basis, but that's fine. Just sleep silently at night, knowing that there's Eddie Gallagher's out there who will go do bad things to bad people on a regular basis, and this is a guy who's deployed over a dozen times, twenty years. <clears throat> so he gets back a year later. They don't they don't like him. You know, he has hard tactics, right? The daytime missions. Guys don't like daytime missions. <clears throat> Reason being is we own the night. I was a night stalker. I was a death stalker. Like we own the night. Uh, they don't have the same capabilities as us, but they hide very well. And it's often dry holes. No one's there. Mm -hmm. So going during the day, they surprise them. That's not normal tactics for us, but it's dangerous for us. So Eddie's people didn't like that. You know, they're young millennial seals. I hate saying that, but they were just. That's the generation. Punks. Yeah. Uh, and I'll call it to their face and I've, <laughs> told them that they're disgrace, but you know, I've got no tact. Um, and I know the community, and I know the one that was in SEAL Team 6 has been kicked out since then. Um, long, long story short, we almost set this man to prison. You know, we, we stormed his house at gunpoint while he was out and took his children and wife out in their underwear in front of their neighbors. It's no reason for that. Um, they wanted to make a case so that these prosecutors would have a name for themselves. They didn't care about the truth. They didn't care about the narrative. They didn't try to track down the Iraqi general. We did. You know, luckily, we still have friends there. Um, they didn't care about the evidence. They told congressmen. Who, who is they? The, the NCIS and the prosecutors. Got it. Uh, talk about prosecutorial misconduct. Uh, it, it, it's a travesty. And what people don't it's understand. It's such a disgrace, man. In the military, you're essentially proven guilty guilty till proven innocent and that was the narrative that we pushed that was the first article that i pushed that got incredible traction uh ended up talking about it on fox news with andrea ended up going and and having a um, a good relationship with the fox news team to make sure that the the truth is being heard because the new york times hillary clinton everyone jumped on this bandwagon of Eddie Gallagher should go to jail. Who are you, yeah. Secretary of State? Who, besides just leaving all of my friends to die in freaking Benghazi, you want to pipe up and now send another person to lose their life with no knowledge of the facts just because Donald Trump says it? I mean, I don't care if you guys want to piss on each other, but don't use Navy SEALs as a punching as bag. A, yeah. You know, we're, we're not disposable. And they consider us disposable. So I want to have a voice for... Eddie and people like the Baltimore six who are wrongfully accused of murder as well, mm -hmm. you know, cause these guys deserve the presumption of innocence. And a lot of times they don't have a salary that can afford a half a million dollar defense counsel. And that's what we were able to help get them is, you know, they had uh, Donald Trump's attorney. They had uh, Bernie Carrick's uh, old attorney. Like they had some of the best attorneys in the country, mm -hmm. uh, but they're not cheap. Right. So that's, that was the David versus Goliath. And the only way that we were able to win, I think, is that we had so many voices, so many people. I'm one of many, many, many yeah. more. Pete Hegseth, you know, would talk to the president directly about this and then relay information. And that guy is incredible. Mm -hmm. I talk about a dude who's got a voice that uses it very well. Um, but that's, that's why I, I think ultimately uh, there's so much pressure that people decided to do the right thing. Right. And, and tell the truth. And the, the truth is that Eddie's a salty, old school Navy SEAL. But, you know, if the Iraqi general said keep him alive, he's going to keep him alive. Right. The other guy did a mercy kill, understood. I mean, this is the travesties of war. This is stuff that people don't want to hear about. Then, then, then either 
I turn don't, a blind eye or let's talk about it and, and change some. There's a lot things. of things that happen. They get brought up into the general public that I don't think should the general public should know about at all. Well, we did it for all through that last administration while I'd be deployed. You know, my call sign became a movie. You know, like there's there's when our unit would deploy into Afghanistan and we were Prince. Prince 4-1, Prince 4-2 was the call sign used in uh, going to kill bin Laden. You know, like all that information that gets leaked out, you know, mm-hmm. uh, unit symbols, locations, ways and means. And, and, and these people make tons of money off it. And nothing happens to them. You know, uh, you got Hillary Clinton can do just about anything. Nothing happens to her. And then you have an individual who sends a picture of a deceased soldier like Eddie Gallagher. That's that's what they charged him with. Ultimately, it was the only one of like 90 charges, but that's the one they got him with. Um, everyone else, no one got charged, but that'll be a felony on his record. He'll be reduced down to E1. He'll lose his retirement and, uh, a lot of bad things will happen. So the fight is still on (sighs) and we're going to continue to push. And, uh, hopefully the president doesn't have to intervene and hopefully NCIS and the Navy stops having me punch them in the face. But that's what I'm about to do. It's absolutely crazy. Well, that's a great segue into the nine line foundation. All I've heard from you is how much you're constantly trying to help other people you've you know with the fundraiser for your buddy that lost his legs to fighting for all these other people standing up for the country like you guys are nine line is all about just helping everyone else out that's what a nine line is explain to these guys what nine line means and the military and nine lines a Kazavet call so if someone gets injured on the battlefield they'd call someone like me and i would pull them off and you know to your point this stuff's fun if you ever get down to the Veterans Village, you get to work with Kendall and talk to him and like hear his story mm-hmm. and, and see how appreciated he is about having a house and how he wants to pay it forward. Well, it feels good to help people and it's fun for you. When, like, when it becomes a passion, it's like you're not doing it for recognition or the money or any of that kind of stuff that may come along with it, even though. So the Nine Line Foundation is, a, is your nonprofit foundation that you guys have uh, events and you guys listening have heard me talk about the the 5k 10k run every year we always attend it we always sponsor we always promote it we do what we can uh to to help raise funds for that but the nine line foundation um they just you guys just opened the night the village the homeless veteran village is it home is it homeless or wounded or both homeless homeless and there's a so there's this is a group project and this is where it gets tricky because our foundation initiative is transitional housing. So we have a section of this village. So it's, it's 12 houses. And those individuals in that section of the village will be going to Nine Line on a daily basis and we'll be teaching them aquaponics through a partnership with Georgia Southern. Right. And it teaches them a skill set. So the idea is housing first, not housing only. And it's a hand up, not a handout. And that, that gets political. It gets stupid uh, because people don't like the ideology and it should be housing only. So there's there's um, still things going on with that project, uh, but it, overall the end state is getting people off the street uh, and, and we're doing that very rapidly. The next thing is now what? It's like declaring victory um, in Iraq is circa 2004. You right. know, that's, it's premature. You know, we just started, this initiative is steeped in theory and uh, we're taking the best of everything around the country, I think, mm-hmm. and, and going to set it in motion. But it, it's only going to be successful because the city of Savannah and the individuals around here are supporting it. And, and if we can continue to educate individuals that people on the street are just like you and me. Yeah. You know, one paycheck away from being homeless. I've got a lot of friends and family that could be, you know, homeless. Right. Uh, and, and it's encouraging them to go and reconnect with family members or if they have none then it's encouraging them to be self-reliant you know how to reintroduce themselves into society you right. can't just hang out in the woods all day so the village that he's talking about they've built a uh, a village of tiny homes so how many homes are on there now there's um 20 but only 10 are occupied at this point okay so and that, is that going to be max capacity is 20 no, uh, keep th- going. There, it's planned for seventy-four. Okay, cool. So they're building tiny homes one at a time. They get volunteers come in. They raise funds to pay for materials and things of that nature. Uh, and they're building a, a and village volunteers. of volunteers. You know, we have the materials at our facility, and people will come there on the weekends and help us start, build these. Yeah, building. Mm-hmm. Um, so they've got this village of tiny homes to to house these homeless veterans. But alongside of that, they also have made efforts in the past to build complete homes for 
wounded vets and that are wheelchair accessible Correct. and things of that nature. How many of those have you guys done? Couple, four. Two, four? Mm -hmm. That's super cool, man. Yeah, so. Around the uh, country. It's been, it's been a lot of fun. And that's what I'm saying. It's fun to go to these different communities and show them this initiative and see how many people come out of the woodwork saying, I want to help. Mm -hmm. It's just one person to spearhead it. And it's not always me. It's usually a, a coalition right. of individuals. I like to help as much as I can. Uh, but it's building the teams, it's building the initiatives, and it's encouraging people. So we have so many employees that work for us that, to your point, say, hey, I want to help this person, this organization. I say, hey, come up with a plan. Yeah. And then well, and a lot that. of your employees are volunteers for the foundation. Absolutely. And they don't get paid for their time in that. No. They all, like, everybody's a volunteer. We, we have zero paid employees for the foundation. Right. Which means all the money goes towards the veterans and the which is important to me because in the beginning when I was donating substantial funds and watching it go and be wasted waste. and thwarted, uh, you know, extravagant trips for executives of nonprofits and uh, ridiculous pay compensation compared to what they were doing. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and it, it just made me upset because that, that's money that's hard to earn. And I know I've, I'm like many other people. If you work hard, you want to see your money put to good use. So I'll donate to foundations that have great reputations, uh, not just my own. And, and I really do protect that reputation of if I take a dollar from you, it's going to that specific initiative and nothing else is not going to private jets and fancy dinners. Right. We don't do those things. We shoot weapons and, and uh, <laughs> eat But barbecue. you raise money around it. So a crap load of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one last question. And that's kind of like what the, the, the dynamic has been for you and your family being deployed, building this business, how that's affected kind of the work-life balance with the kids and the family and your wife. Um, what has that been like for you? There's no such thing as a work-life balance. They have to go together or else they won't survive. I think the hardest thing in the military is there's no way to really do a work-life balance. I can't bring my kids with me on trips. Mm -hmm. uh, It'd be really dangerous. <laughs> uh, like a stowaway. Uh, but it, it, that's the hardest part is that I'm going to be gone for s upwards of a year and you need to take care of these children. I'm going to Skype with you as best I can, but that, there's no balance mm -hmm. here. Uh, with my job now, it, it's a great balance. I mean, last week I grabbed an RV. We drove to Rome River, hung out with Luke Combs, drove down to uh drove up to virginia and went down the jellystone river floated down the river with my I kids saw a lot of those pictures and awesome. then i went up to fox news for the week and i did a bunch of interviews because right. i knew i had to do all of those things right you know we're on a budget rv driving is is smarter with a bunch of kids right uh so you know i got two great danes three kids my father he took the dog <laughs> yeah uh, but we go to these trips and we go to these country concerts and these nascar events and these other things that we sponsor uh, and my kids get to meet really cool people. They don't understand that they're famous, cool people. You know, I, I've got Diamond Dallas Page and other wrestlers, Undertaker, Undertaker yeah. all hanging out. They're like, oh, your friends are really tall. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, you don't know who these people are. Yeah, these were the, he like the people in my day. Yeah, yeah. That, but that's cool. You it's know, super it keeps cool. Them, uh, you know, they get to go and, and see cars go around in circles in the, in the pit. You ever feel like you're spoiling them with some of that stuff? No, I don't think so. They're experiences. You can't spoil someone with the experiences. And it's not like we're going and, and eating caviar and, and drinking, right. like, you know, doing stupid things right, with, right, right. with money. We're going to fun events. And these are things that I'm, I'm actually to, making money off these things. Like right. I, I go to country events and, you know, we do very well with selling. What's cool is that like those events are allowing you to almost, and you can't make up for lost time, but a lot of the times that you were deployed and away from your family, it's almost like you're being able to make up for that. Like I wasn't Absolutely. here f for a lot of your life, especially for your, how old is your oldest? 16, 17, 17. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Right. Does that blow your mind? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's exactly what that's like. Cause I wasn't able to do a lot of those things and it was more difficult. And I, I say that uh, story of, of balance, right? You know, my wife's a nurse practitioner now. She was able to go back to school. She got her master's from Columbia. Like she would fly from here to New York every uh, week. And so I got to experience being the dad, you know, yeah. I, I'm spoiled cause I got a nanny. So I'm not gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, everyone else out there before that, you know, I understand you, yeah. uh, but I get so much stuff going on. There's no way there's, I, would, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't be able to do all these things. So we have a great continuity for my children with a, with a nanny who's been with us for a couple of years and she's like family. Um, but without the, that, uh, 
balance. You know, my wife has desires to become a nurse practitioner. We have to make that happen. That get, can't be put on hold forever. Right. She did it for she years, it, yeah. Yeah. years to help us grow this business. But now it's she's doing that, and she does part time helping out with Nine Line. You know, comes in does modeling. Sure, well, she was a big part of Nine Line to begin with. Yeah, I she mean, was she customer was... service production. She was the only person who did all of our production with our first directed garment, and and I would, I mean, without her, yeah, you're deployed. She's at home running the business. Yeah, we, we did, I didn't have money. She to was anyone. everything. You know, yeah. she, she's she's got deferred compensation. We got to pay her down. The road. <laughs> uh, I like that. <laughs> but it's it's don't tell my wife, don't tell yeah, my wife that one. <laughs> but, but you got to think about it. So did I. I didn't get paid. Of course, you know, none I, of us I, got paid in the beginning. And that's but where, we did it because we loved it. Yeah. yeah, and that's that's where you you get to see now that I have I've got a nice house and I've mm-hmm. got nice cars and I've got a nice building and I've got nice I got nice debt too. But yeah, uh, well, yeah you made a lot of sacrifices to get but there. We made a lot of off. and we've worked our butt off. And I'm I'm proud of what we've accomplished and to go from. You know, a tiny little uh, apartment that we lived in because I, I, I needed to yeah. liquidate everything. To six years later, where we are now, it's it's incredible. It's definitely inspiring for a lot of people I know. Mm-hmm. Um, it's humbling for me, uh, but the work life balance now is more achievable because I am my own boss and I can set my own hours. It just so happens, just like in the special operations, my boss would tell me. Tyler, I don't care when you come in or when you leave. As long as you get all your work done, just what happens, you're going to have to come in super early. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you're going to probably have to stay super, super late, late and work on Saturdays. Right. And that's where I was this last Saturday, working with everyone else until about five o'clock with the children so my wife could work on the house at home because uh, she, she, we had a small leak in our in our bathtub and she, she wanted to fix it. Um, so <laughs> and she... By the time I walked in my house on Saturday around five, because I had a dinner to go to, I walked in and see that there's water streaming from my ceilings and from the floors and everywhere. So uh, we, we, we didn't fix the leak and my insurance company hates me. Uh, but, you know, she looked at me and she said, I ruined our house. It's, I'm so sorry. I'm like, Angela, there's nothing. No one's getting shot at. Nothing. We can fix all of these things. This is not the end it's of the world. First world problems. It you is. Know? It's, it's like, that first world problem. That's what we have insurance for, uh, mm-hmm. even though they hate you now. Couple they totally couple of claims here recently. Yes. Unfortunately, the original like the starting place of Nine Line burned down recently. Three which weeks was ago. Your old house. And my insurance company hates me. So yeah. three weeks ago, I have a house that burnt all the way to the ground, and then now I have probably Half 50, 60 grand worth of damage yeah. at my current house. And at the end of the day, none of that stuff. I mean, it's it's money. It sucks. Um, but none of that stuff matters. It really doesn't. Everyone's still healthy, happy. No one got injured. That's why people try to figure out like, hey, I, it takes a lot to really rattle me. Mm-hmm. It's probably because well. weapons or something are out. Uh, <laughs> but you know, at the end of the day, you got to stay calm, cool, collected, and and just be the, the person in the storm that can weather it that right. everyone else looks to. Because right now we've got 70,000 units that we have to get out the door, right? That's why... I'd, I almost bailed on this, but I didn't. I appreciate uh, that. Yeah, uh, we're we're pulling twenty four hour shifts since Fourth of July. Yeah, that's everyone, um, so myself included, and we have to hit records in order to get products out the door. You know, we don't know exactly how we're going to do it, but we do know that we can't accomplish it by going home. And that's where, again, my my wife understands these these times where I'm like, hey. I'm, I'm not, not going to be, be around home this <laughs> yeah. week. I'm going to grab the RV and sleep outside the the building. Right. Um, and those are the sacrifices she understands. And as long as there's a path to being able to have a little bit more. A little bit of light at the end of the exactly. tunnel. Exactly. Yeah. So I call it path to profitability or a path to happiness or whatever you want to call it. There's right. got to be a end state that's not this never ending, you know, moving, that constantly you're, moving you're finish dragging. line. Because yeah. otherwise it's like being a degenerate gambler. Like at what point is enough enough? And I asked that to my friends who are degenerate gamblers. Uh, I don't know that even for myself. Like should, everyone asks, find that. Out. Well, everybody says like, well, what do you? What's your like? I don't. I honestly don't have a goal. You know, until recently, have I really figured out like I just love to work, and I love what we're doing, and I'm super passionate about it, and I just love to work, and that's always like, well, when is enough enough? Like we're in a good place. We're financially, we're we're good. Like I could work. You know, like I'm not worried about that. So it's like. Well, it's not really the money. So like, of course everybody wants to work and make more money, but like 
it's not really that what it is for me. I just enjoy it. And now what I'm realizing is like, I just want to kind of my big goal for all of it is just to make an impact for my family, for future generations or whatever the case is, or, Oh, great grandfather beef did X or whatever. And just inspire and encourage other people kind of along the way. So, uh, you know, it's funny cause I don't like for, there is not really a finish line for me. I don't know where that is. But. Yeah. It, and I, I don't think there has to be a finish line, you know, as long as you just continue to live that day, to it's and it sounds super corny, like whatever day yeah, right. cool is. But it's, but it's true. It, if you're waking up every day like, man, I can't wait to get through this day so I can get to something down the road, well, you're you should probably look at that. Like every mm -hmm. day I wake up, I'm like, I can't wait to go to work. I love black rifle coffee. That's what I'm gonna have. I'm gonna probably do some physical therapy on the way there so I can feel better. And then I I get there, I interact with people that I love talking to on a daily basis that yeah. I care and about. And you have uh, what going on 200 employees, yeah. I, I'm pretty sure I love every one of them. You got some awesome Not in that there. weird way either. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's it's a uh, it's cool. And yeah. we get to decide, you know, it, there's drama and there's people who like to come in and create drama. That's the one thing that'll get you fired faster than anything is yeah. screwing is up the culture. The culture. And yeah. it's the culture is drama free and it's individuals who like being around each other at work after work. Right. And don't mess with that. Cool. Awesome. Well, I know you got to run. Thank you for coming and giving us your time. Go get some shirts shipped out. I appreciate it. Thanks, where, man. where can everybody find you? Uh, NineLineApparel.com. You can physically find me at the building. Uh, you can find 450 me 450 Fort Argyle Road in Savannah. That's right. <laughs> Nine Line Apparel. Go do some shopping. Get a cup of coffee if you're in the Savannah area. Um, go check out their website, like he said, at NineLineApparel.com. And Charleston. The Charleston store and the River Street store. Mm -hmm. You can also find Tactical Baby Gear in all those stores. That's right. <laughs> awesome. Thanks again, dude. All right, dude. Appreciate you. Yep, yep.